Hey, praise the Lord. Greetings, everybody. My name is Clinton. To those of you who are in Christ Jesus, you know me as Brother Clinton, and this is the Word Prophet Channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth. This is the commandment of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, it's a commandment. It's not a good suggestion. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So that's why I'm here, and I hope that's why you're here as well. Praise the Lord. Brother John wrote, the apostle John wrote, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So for these last several years that I've been here on YouTube, I've been preaching and teaching many things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ from his word, and one of the things that I've been telling you over and over and over and over and over and over and over again is to abide in the word of God. Stop going to church. Stop watching all kinds of videos on YouTube, and I know you're watching me in a video right now, but what you really need to be doing is abiding in the Word of God. And may this video be in help to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I am an invader here. Google is the devil. Did you know that? Google is the devil. And YouTube is a veritable jungle of lies and deception and all sorts of ungodliness. And I am an invader here. And I'm not going to say that I'm the only one on YouTube preaching the truth because I'm not. But it is very, very rare to find anyone preaching the truth here on YouTube. What is very, very common here on YouTube is to find people who think that they are Christians and who think that they are called of God preaching many different things. And if you have your Holy Bible, King James Version, please open up with me to Matthew chapter 19. And while you're doing that, I just want to continue the thought that I was speaking. Just like in the days when our Lord Jesus Christ walked the streets of Galilee, so it is today that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were and are still today arguing. They were always arguing. And you know what? They were both wrong. The Pharisees were wrong and the Sadducees were wrong on most points. And in this particular point that we're going to talk about, they were also both wrong, as they still are today. And today it is very popular for people who want to serve God to go to a seminary or a Bible college. And what happens when people go to a seminary or a Bible college? They get confused because that's what seminaries and Bible colleges are for. They're, they're from the devil, uh, basically operated by the Jesuits of Rome, and they're there to confuse you. God never, ever, ever sent anybody to a Bible college or a seminary, not once ever. Um, God raises up his people. The Bible says that all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. The Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Bible says, in thy light shall we see light. And Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. He didn't say, if you go to Bible college, then you're my disciples indeed. He didn't say, if you go to a Baptist church or a Lutheran church or a Catholic church or a Pentecostal church, that you are my disciples indeed. He said, if ye continue in my word. And so that's what God wants us to do. And for those of you who know me, you know that way back many years ago, when I first got born again, I got sucked into the vortex of theology, and I was so hungry for God, and I didn't have a man, a man of God in my life to lead me and to teach me. I just was born again, and I was just on fire for God, if I may use that term, and um, so people were handing me books about the Bible, and I was going to this church and that church, and just kind of drinking up everything that I could get my hands on about God. Uh, because I thought that was the right thing to do, and it was the wrong thing to do. And after about two years of that, I became so confused, I even got caught up with the Calvinists for a little while. And I believed the Calvinist doctrine for a little while, until God got a hold of me and he said, you need to stop that. Okay. Now when I say that he said he need to stop, you need to stop that, I'm not saying that God said to me in an audible voice that I could hear uh, with my ears, um, as he had at other times, but not that particular time. He just let me know with all clarity that I needed to stop doing what I was doing. There was no question in my heart, in my mind, that God was speaking to me and telling me to stop doing what I was doing. And what he told me was to stop reading all those theology books, to stop reading the books, to stop going to church services, and to start seeking him in his word. 
and fast and pray, and he would show me the truth. And he did, and he still is. Praise the Lord. So his word is true. When Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you shall be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He wasn't just being poetic, and he wasn't kidding. He was telling the truth, because he is the true and faithful witness. And so if we will stay in his word, then we will know the truth. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees are and still, uh, pardon me, were and still are completely confused. And so one of the things that causes much confusion in the church business today, in the religious arenas today, is the biblical doctrine of marriage and divorce and adultery. And it's really not hard to understand at all. It was back in 1998 when I was confronted with a situation, uh, having been born again, but I wasn't saved yet. I didn't know about the gospel yet. I just was born again and seeking the Lord with all my heart and, and staying in his word every day. And I was confronted with a situation where a man that I considered to be a brother in Christ was about to marry a divorced woman. And I had never studied that out at the time, but to me it just didn't sit right. And the others who professed to be Christians as well were saying, this is great. You know, she's a Christian woman. She, you know, she was a minister, so to speak, and all this stuff. And, but she was divorced, and this man was going to marry her. And I said, this just doesn't sound right to me. And so I did what I always do whenever men are saying different things, and I'm not sure about what the truth is. I retired myself from all men, and I got in my Bible, and I fasted, and I prayed. And I got in my Bible and I sought God in his word. And he showed me in his word about the doctrine of marriage and divorce. And he showed me that, well, the truth of what he said very succinctly, whosoever shall marry her that is put away from her husband doth commit adultery. If you marry a divorced woman, then you're committing adultery because you're living with another man's wife. Because a judge may have granted her a divorce, but God did not. And she is still bound to that man as long as he lives. So if you're married to a divorced woman and her husband is still alive, then you're in trouble, my friend, because you're living in adultery with another man's wife. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about, although it's related to it. What I'm here to talk to you about is one verse of the scripture that causes people to become very confused in the religious circles. And that is Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. So let's read it. May God bless the reading of his word. It says, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Praise the Lord. Now, I know I just picked one verse out of a passage, so let's read a bit of the passage so that we can get a better idea through the context of exactly what's going on here. So, let's start in verse 3. It says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. Okay, this is a little key. This is a little clue. This tells us that the Pharisees came to him not because they wanted to learn, not because they recognized him as a rabbi, a teacher, not because they had a question, an earnest question that they wanted the answer to, but because they wanted to tempt him. They wanted to try to trip him up in his words so that they would have something to accuse him for. Because they hated him. They hated him. Why? Because he spoke the truth. And he set the people free from their religious system of bondage and oppression. So the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? They asked him this because it was a point of contention among them, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was a point of contention in the synagogues, just like it still is today in the churches. I mean, how many books out there have been written about the subject of a man putting away his wife? I mean, if you just look on... Let's just do this real quick. I'm going to go to a YouTube search bar, and I'm going to search YouTube for marriage and divorce. And let's put the word Bible in there. Bible teaching. Okay. Okay, this doesn't tell me how many results there are, so I'm going to copy and paste that into a Google search. Marriage and Divorce, Bible Teaching. 24,300,000 results. 24,300,000 results. 
there are a plethora, a multitude of people out there who profess to be Christians who all have their opinion on marriage and divorce. And I'm not here to say that I'm better than anybody because I'm not. But what I'm here to say is that, as I've said already, if you'll seek God in his word, he will show you the truth. And it's not, it doesn't have to be a point of contention. It's not confusing. It's only confusing to those that are rebellious and ungodly. Theologians, professional pastors, people that walk around calling themselves reverend this and pastor that and bishop so and so. Flashing their, you know, their, their degrees from seminary. I've got my degree from seminary. Oh, that's really nice and everything, but that doesn't mean anything to God, and it doesn't mean anything to me. I've got a printer right here to my right side, and it's got a lot of paper, and I've got another stack of paper over there that I got at Walmart that I can print. I can print degrees all day long if I want to. It's worthless. That means absolutely nothing. A seminary does not have any authority to ordain anybody to be anything, at least not in the Church of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again because maybe you weren't paying attention a seminary or a Bible college does not have the authority to ordain anybody to be anything in the church of Jesus Christ. So you might have a piece of paper from a seminary, and maybe to you it's worth something, but to God it isn't, nor is it worth anything to me as a Christian. And I'm not trying to be degrading or anything, it's just, it, that's just the fact. It's worthless. It's not worth anything the only thing that you get at a seminary, you get two things at a seminary. You get confused and you get a piece of paper. You get confused and you get a piece of paper. And for that, you paid whatever it is that you paid. And I'm very sorry that you did that. But that's the truth of the matter. So the reason that people are confused about the doctrine of marriage and divorce is because they get caught up in theology. Theology is a form of witchcraft which uses words and phrases most likely in foreign languages like Greek and Hebrew, to confuse people away from the truth that is the word of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So the, the doctrine of marriage and divorce, as it is set forth in the Bible, is not confusing at all. It's just a matter of us abiding in the word of God. So that said, let's continue in the word of God. Matthew chapter 19, we read verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. This was written in Genesis, in the very beginning. Genesis is a word that means the beginning. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? You see, they're still trying to trip him up. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her, pardon me, he said whoso, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Period. Now, I totally understand that when we are used to the theology that has been handed to us in the churches all of our lives, that this can be a confusing passage of the Scripture. But if we will just be washed with the Word of God, if we will just put away all that theological nonsense and stop going to church and just read our Bibles and fast and pray. When I say our Bibles, I'm talking about the King James Bible. If you speak English, the Word of God is preserved for us in the King James Bible. Other Bibles in English that are worded differently are not God's Word. And they obviously can't be God's Word because they don't say the same thing. Now, if the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work, 
then it stands to reason that if your Bible and my Bible don't say the same thing, then they can't both be God's word. You see? If your Bible says, except for sexual immorality, and my Bible says, except for fornication, then one of our Bibles isn't God's word. Because Jesus didn't say, except for sexual immorality. He said, except for fornication. And I know Jesus didn't speak it in English, but the translation of the original Greek that was written in the original gospel of, well, Matthew was actually written in Hebrew and then it was translated into Greek later, but the translation of the original manuscripts is right here in the KJV Bible. Fornication is one thing. Sexual immorality is another thing. So the phrase sexual immorality is not in the scripture. So if your Bible says sexual immorality, I suggest that you go back to the front page of your Bible and look and see that it's a copyrighted novel. It's not God's word. God's word doesn't have a copyright on it. It's not owned by men. It's God's word. Praise the Lord. So that said, let's go back to verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Who was Jesus speaking to? He was speaking to the leaders of the Jews, the rulers of the Jews, the teachers, the Pharisees. And there were some Sadducees there too, I'm pretty sure. He was speaking to the ones of Israel that were ordained to be teachers, of whom it was written, I have said, ye are gods. In the 82nd Psalm, it was written of them, I have said, ye are gods. They were the teachers of the people of Israel. They were the authorities over the people of Israel. They were the ones that God had appointed over the people of Israel to feed the flock. And we can read in Ezekiel chapter 34 of how angry God was with them because they were feeding themselves off of the flock instead of feeding the flock. And so God said, I will come and seek and search out my own sheep. And that's what he did in Jesus Christ, his son. And that's why Jesus said, I am come to seek and save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Praise the Lord. So Jesus was speaking to the leaders of the house of Israel. And he said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Come with me to the third chapter of Jeremiah. The prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, a prophet among the people of Israel who preached the word of God to the people of God for 40 years and they didn't believe him. 40 years Jeremiah preached the word of the Lord to the people of Israel and they continually refused to believe him until Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came and took them into captivity and burned their temple to the ground, burned their city to the ground, and they were there for 70 years. Jeremiah was a prophet of God. And in the third chapter of Jeremiah, it says in verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. Israel is the bride of God. She is the bride of God. Now let me explain to you a little bit about how marriage works. Not in Western society, but in reality, according to God, before God. This is how a marriage works. and This is how it was done before Western society perverted everything that we know today. A man has a daughter. This daughter grows up to be 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. She's a virgin. She lives in her father's house. She doesn't have a, an iPhone. Uh, she doesn't have a, a car. She doesn't go out to the clubs. She lives in her father's house, and she serves her father and mother and her brothers and sisters in their house. She learns at an early age how to cook, how to clean, how to be a mother, you know, how to raise children, things like that. That's what little girls should be learning. And what, by the time that, they're, that they reach puberty, which the Bible calls the flower of her age, which is about 11 or 12 years old, they're ready to be married. Now, I'm not saying that you should marry a 12-year-old because in Western society, that's against the law and that can land you in jail. However, a 12-year-old is a woman. She's not a little girl and she's not, um, she's not a child. Now, the state will call her a minor and I respect that and we as Christians respect that and so we don't marry a woman until she is 18 years old unless we have her parents' permission. So I'm not suggesting that anybody should marry what the state calls a minor. What I'm setting forth is 
nature, and it's the law of God. A man or a woman is a man or a woman when they reach puberty, not when they reach 18 years old. So uh, when, a, when, a, when a man is 18 years old, he's already been a man for like five or six years. Uh, and society teaches him to act like a child. You won't be an adult until you're 18. So here, to have a, have a skateboard and some video games and just act like a doofus until you're 18 years old. Did I just really say doofus? I think I did. But anyway, um, this is how it works. A, a, a man has a daughter, and she's raised up in her father's house, and she learns how to cook and how to clean and how to serve so that she can be a good wife someday. And then um, when a man comes along and, and fancies her, then he says, well, I fancy your daughter. And he says, well, you, if you seem like a good man, you know, if he seems like a good man, you seem like a good man. So, yes, you can have my daughter. So the man says, OK, name your dowry. And he says, you know, a dowry is a price that a man pays for a man's daughter to marry her. And the father says, whatever his dowry is, you know, a hundred dollars or two camels and a chicken or whatever the, you know, the, the dowry might be, you know, six head of cattle or whatever. And so. The man gives the father the dowry, and that woman becomes his wife. She's betrothed unto him. He hasn't had sex with her. He doesn't. He hasn't known her. Okay, to know her is to have sexual intimacy with her. So he hasn't known her, but he takes her into his house, and she lives with him until the time of their wedding. And at the time of their wedding, then he has. They have a wedding, and he goes in unto her, and he knows her, and then their marriage is consummated. And it's permanent. It's for the rest of their lives. So that period of time between the time that he betrothed her unto himself by purchasing her from his, her father until the time that he marries her, that's called betrothal. She belongs to him. She's called by his name. She's part of his house. But they haven't consummated their marriage yet. He hasn't married her yet. Okay, some of you might be confused by that. But it's this is reality. To marry means to join two things into one. The act of a man marrying his wife is the man saying before God, I take you to be my wife, and then taking her into the marriage bed where he marries her. That's what marriage is. When a man takes her, he, he takes her with his word, you are my, I take you to be my wife, and then he takes her into a bed and he knows her carnally, that's the act of marrying her. It's joining his body with hers. So they are then married. Okay. Now, when they're betrothed, that's part of a marriage. But the marriage isn't consummated until he marries her, until he has a wedding, takes her into the marriage bed, and marries her. Okay. He can have a wedding with all their family members and, and, and say before all them, I take this woman to be my wife. Or he can take her out into the woods somewhere before God and say, I take you to be my wife. Okay. Whatever he wants to do. And then he takes her into the marriage bed and he marries her. That's why it's called the marriage bed, because that's where he marries her. And that's where they have their marital union thereafter. So God took Israel to be his wife. She is his betrothed. The church of Jesus Christ is the bride of God's son. Israel is the bride of God. She still is. That has never ceased to be reality. And there is coming a time called the Great Tribulation when God will purge Israel and a remnant shall come forth and shall populate the land of Israel and they shall be as the stars of heaven for multitude. They will be the actual physical seed of Abraham. So, God said in Jeremiah 3.14, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. Turn, O obedient and beloved children. No, turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. For I am married unto you. I am married unto you. Just like Joseph and Mary, okay, he had not yet known her, which means that he hadn't yet married her, but yet she was his wife. She was living in his house. And she was called by his name. And Joseph thought that she had been unfaithful to him before their wedding. Because all of a sudden she was pregnant. And, you know, if you're betrothed to a woman and you haven't known her, you purchased her from her father and her father said she was a virgin. And you haven't known her yet, but all of a sudden she turns up pregnant. Well, that would cause just about anybody to think that she had been with another man. I would have thought that and so would you. 
However, we know that that wasn't the case, that that which was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost. But before Joseph knew that, the Bible says that he was minded to put her away privily, privately, secretly, so as not to bring reproach upon her father's house, and so as not to cause her to be stoned to death and burned with fire. So he was getting ready to put her away. Why was he getting ready to put her away? Because Moses wrote in the law, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that he find no favor, pardon me, that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him give her a writing of divorcement and send her out of his house, and she may go and be another man's wife. This is written in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Verses 1 and 2. And that was what the Pharisees were referring to when they asked Jesus this question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? That's what they were referring to. And they themselves were confused about it and argued about it between themselves. So they imagined that this would be a good question to present to Jesus. To see what he says so that they could try to trip him up. But you see, Jesus wasn't confused about this. Nor are his people because it is a very simple matter. I shouldn't say it's simple, because it's not, but it's a very easy matter to understand. We just have to go through the scriptures and read what the Bible says. So, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, this is two different things. To take a wife and to marry her is two different things. To take a wife means to go to her father's house and purchase her. She is a young virgin. She's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, or however old she is. So once she's past the flower of her age, she's old enough to marry. And so she's a virgin. She's lived in her father's house. She hasn't been running around on the streets at night and, you know, smoking dope and riding around in boys' cars and stuff like that. She's been in her father's house, serving her father, learning how to serve a husband. And so a man goes to her, her father and he purchases her with a dowry and takes her to his house. That's taking a wife. Marrying her is when the, the night of their wedding comes and he invites people or he decides not to invite people or whatever. And he says before God, I take you to be my wife. And then he takes her into the marriage bed and he marries her. And if while he's marrying her in the marriage bed, it come to pass that she that he finds out that she's not a virgin. And I'm not going to explain that for those of you who don't understand. Maybe you can look it up online or something. But there is a way physically to tell by looking at a woman's secret place if she's a virgin or not. And so if he finds out that she's not a virgin and she was supposedly a virgin when he purchased her, then that means that she's been with someone else. And so the purpose of the betrothal, period, is to prove the faithfulness of a man's bride before he marries her. He's taken her to be his wife, and there is a period of time, whatever the man decrees it to be, it could be six months, it could be a year, whatever the man decides it's going to be, there's a period of time when he's going to prove the faithfulness of his wife. And when the time comes that he marries her, if she's still a virgin, then he knows that she has been faithful. God has put this security seal integrated into the, into the biology of a woman so that a man can know whether or not she is a virgin when he takes her into the marriage bed to marry her. And so if it, if it comes to pass that he finds some uncleanness in her because she hasn't been faithful to him, then he can give her a writing of divorcement and put her away. He can't take her to a judge and get a divorce. He can write out a writing of divorcement because it's his wife, it's his house. He's the one that has the authority over the matter, not the state. And so if he found some uncleanness in her when he went in unto her to marry her, then he gives her this writing of divorcement and he sends her out of his house and she can go be another man's wife. Why? Because their marriage was never consummated. Because when he went to consummate his marriage with her, he saw that she was not a virgin. And so he gave her a writing of divorcement and he sent her out of his house. She violated the covenant because she was a fornicator. She was a whore. She was with another man between the time that he purchased her from her father and the time that he married her. So their marriage is null and void. It was never consummated. She broke the covenant. So, she's free to leave his house and go marry somebody else. But if the man marries her, 
and he keeps her as his wife, whether she's a virgin or not, and he lives with her as his wife, then he may not put her away all the days of his life. The only reason that a man can put away his wife is for the cause of fornication. As Jesus said right here in Matthew chapter 9, verse nine, pardon me, Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, and marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband doth commit adultery. The only provision in God's law for a man to put away his wife is for the cause of fornication. If she has been found guilty of being with another man between the time that he bought her from her father's house and the time that he took her into the marriage bed to marry her, if she has been guilty of being with another man during that time, then he has the right to give her a writing of divorcement, put it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And she is no longer a married woman, and she can go and be another man's wife. That's the only provision for a man to put away his wife. And there is no provision for a woman to put away her husband under any circumstance ever. The wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. If the man puts away his betrothed wife for any other reason, he is breaking God's law. So, God said in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, for I am married unto you. God said to Israel, I am married unto you. But if we back up a little bit in the chapter, in verse 8, Jeremiah 3, 8, it says, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Now, there are some of those who might argue, why did God say adultery and not fornication? Let me clarify something. Fornication and adultery are two different words. They don't mean the same thing. Fornication is the act of having sexual intercourse with someone that isn't married. And adultery is having sexual intercourse with someone who is married, a woman who is married. If you're having sexual intercourse with a woman who is married, you're committing adultery. How is it that a woman who is betrothed could be guilty of adultery? Well, because fornication for a married woman is an adulterous act because she's married. If a woman is betrothed to a husband and she's found guilty of fornication before their wedding, that's an adulterous act because she's a married woman. It's just that simple. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah 3 8, and when I saw, pardon me, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So God gave Israel a writing of divorce. What's he talking about? Well, Israel went into captivity, into Assyria. God gave her up because of her continual whoredoms. She continued to go after other gods, after other gods, after other gods, until God finally said, you know what? Okay, if you want those other gods, they're yours. I take my hand off of you. And so he gave her a writing of divorcement and he put her away. That's what Moses was writing about when he wrote Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Yes, it pertains to a man and his wife, but it's not about a man and his wife. It's never been about a man and his wife. It's always been about God and his bride. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 24, 1 and 2 is all about. It's not about men and women. Yes, it applies to men and women because it's part of the law of God. But the whole Bible is about a marriage. And the whole reason that God made Adam out of the dust of the ground and then caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and took a rib out of his side and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And of the rib made he a woman, and he brought the woman to the man, and the man took the woman to be his wife. The whole reason that God did all that was to illustrate the fact that God would take a bride out of the peoples of this world, and she would be called Israel. And from Israel would come Messiah, and God would take a bride for his son out of all the peoples of the world, whether they be Jew or Gentile. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The whole reason that God ordained marriage between a man and a woman is to illustrate to us his covenant that he has ordained with men. That's the whole reason. That's the purpose of a man marrying a woman. 
and of course to bring forth a godly seed, which also pertains to the gospel of Jesus Christ, because every tree has fruit with the seed in itself that brings forth after its own kind. We read this all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. I think it's verse 11. So Israel is the bride of God. He, he was married to her. He took her as his wife. And because of the fact that she was stiff-necked and unfaithful, God put in his own law when Moses came into the picture, when Moses was sent into the world and to deliver the people of Israel, God put into his own law a provision to put away his people Israel for their stubbornness and, and rebellion so that they wouldn't enter into his kingdom eternally and defile it. That's what the betrothal period is for. That's what it's all about. Yes, it applies to a man and a woman, but it's not about a man and a woman. It's never been about a man and a woman. It's always been about God and his people Israel. And when God brought Israel out of Egypt, the family of Abraham, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob was given the name Israel by God. Israel means a prince of God. And when they went down into Egypt with 75 souls and came out 400 years later with a multitude, and God brought them out of Israel by the hand of Moses, pardon me, God brought them out of Egypt by the hand of Moses and intended to bring them through the promised land into that land which then was called Canaan and now it's called Israel. He saw that they were a bunch of hard-hearted, stiff-necked, rebellious, unruly people. And he said, I am not going to take these people into my rest. They shall never enter into my rest, he said, finally, after he had proved them many times and given them many chances. He said, they shall never enter into my rest. It's written in Psalm 95 as well. And so God provided something in his own law so that they that were his bride would have to prove themselves faithful before he would take them into the everlasting covenant and into his kingdom. And so God was betrothed, is betrothed still, to the people of Israel. But the people that are of Israel who are not of Israel, and what I mean by that is Paul said they are not all Israel which are of Israel, some of them can't see the kingdom of God. Some of them do not have God's word abiding in them. In fact, many of them don't. Most of them don't. And that's what Jesus said to them when he came on the scene. He said, why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye have not my Father's word abiding in you. Ye are not of my sheep, as I told you. They were the people of Israel. They were the, the physical, direct descendants of Abraham. But they had not God's word abiding in them. And so God said, ye are not of my sheep. And so God put in his law a provision to keep the hard-hearted and stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious and wicked and disobedient people of Israel out of his kingdom so that they won't defile it because the kingdom of God is holy. Sinners will not enter into the kingdom of God. If you're a sinner, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God unless you get converted into a saint. Praise the Lord. So when God had brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and saw that they were so unruly and stiff-necked and hard-hearted, he put it in the mouth of Moses to write, well, put it in the mouth of Moses to speak and in his hand to write this portion of the law in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him give her a writing of divorcement and send her out of his house, and she may go and be another man's wife. This was never about men and women. It was about God and his people Israel. It was about God's provision in his own law to put away his people Israel. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death until they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. There are many that are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ thinking that all is well and they were Christians and all that good stuff. And they were unfaithful and wicked and stiff-necked and hard-hearted and did not wish to obey his word. And so they, when they enter uh, unto the kingdom of God to, be, to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to say unto them, 
I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And they're going to be very scared and terrified and unpleasantly surprised. And they're going to be, but, 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 Lord. But, Lord, we, 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 we cast out devils in thy name. We did many wonderful works in thy name. We, we prophesied in thy name. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. He has this provision in his own law. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 2 is God's provision in his law to give a writing of divorcement to his people if when we go to the wedding, he finds some uncleanness in us. He finds that we have been unfaithful. He finds that we've been going after other gods like the Trinitarians do in their churches. They go after other gods, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, which are actually Tammuz and Semiramis, going all the way back to Babylon. The Trinity is Babylonian mythology. It's based on Nimrod, the king of Babylon, and his mother, Semiramis, who he fornicated with, and she became pregnant and begat a son named Tammuz. Tammuz was said to be the reincarnation of his father, Nimrod, who was proclaimed to be the sun god. That's where the Babylonians and the, and the Egyptians got their religion from, and that's where the Catholics and Protestants get their religion from. The Trinity doctrine comes from thence. God is not a trinity, he is one, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus, he is the Son of God, he is not God the Son. So those people in the churches that are worshipping a trinity of gods and other gods, a pantheon of gods, and, and the people in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches that have their statues of Jupiter and Venus and Saturn and Pluto, that they've changed the names and, and called them names from the Bible like St. Paul, St. Peter, St. Jude, baby Jesus, Mother Mary, and all that stuff. They're going to stand before Jesus Christ and he's going to say, I never knew you. Because he has a provision in his law to put away a bride in whom he has found uncleanness. That's what it's about. So when we go back to Matthew chapter 19, verse 8, now we can understand why Jesus said what he said. So let's start in verse 4 again. It says, let's start in verse 3 again. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? I can just picture their smug faces. Is it lawful for a wife? To, pardon me. Is it lawful for, for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Tell us, Jesus. You know, because they were always arguing about that between themselves. And they thought Jesus was going to stumble on it too, because in their mind... Well, everybody stumbles on this because it's hard to understand. Well, no, it's not hard to understand. Unless you're rebellious and blind. Unless you refuse the baptism of John because you didn't want to admit that you were a sinner. Yea, then it's hard. But it's not hard at all to one who has obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, repented and been baptized in his name for the remission of sins and received the gift of the Holy Ghost and believes his word and obeys his word. That's why it's written, In thy light shall we see light. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. Well, if it's written, A good understanding have all, though that, all they that do his commandments, then it is to be understood that all they that don't do his commandments will not have a good understanding. So they thought that this would confuse Jesus. But it didn't confuse Jesus, and it doesn't confuse Jesus' people. It's very simple. It's just a matter of abiding in God's word and staying away from theology. So the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Tell us, Jesus. And he answered and said unto them, This is like kindergarten stuff. The beginning. Genesis. Have ye not read? Have ye not read the first page? Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. That's marriage. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness 
of your hearts suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. But from the beginning it was not so. The reason that God suffers men to put away their wives for the cause of fornication isn't because God wanted men to be able to put away their wives. It's a provision that God has put in his law to keep men like these Pharisees out of his kingdom because their hearts are hardened. They have not circumcised the foreskins of their hearts. They were circumcised in the foreskins of their members, their male members. And so they said, we are circumcised. We are the children of Abraham. God is our father. But Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me. Because I came forth from him. And they're like, well, no, we have Abraham for our father. And, and Jesus said, well, if Abraham were your father, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth. Abraham didn't do that. He said, you're of your father, the devil. Yea, they were circumcised in the flesh, but they refused to circumcise their hearts. And God said it at least a couple of times in the Old Testament law. Circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. God is not impressed if you can cut off the foreskin of your male member. He's not impressed by that. Yes, it is part of the covenant for Abraham and those that were in the part of the, the Old Testament. It was part of the covenant, but it wasn't about that. It wasn't about the foreskin of a man's member. It was about the circumcision of his heart. It was a symbol, an outward symbol, a carnal ordinance that meant something. You see, when a man is circumcised, the foreskin which is removed exposes the most sensitive part of his anatomy. And it not only exposes the most sensitive part of his anatomy, and it hurts to do it, but it also makes it much more enjoyable for him when he is with his love in their marriage bed. So the circumcision of a man causes him pain. Even when the, the man is eight days old, it still causes him pain. It hurts. And it exposes the most sensitive vulnerable part of his anatomy. And so it is that God said, circumcise therefore the foreskins of your hearts. Stop hardening your hearts toward me. Give me the most sensitive, vulnerable part of yourself. That's what I want. I am your husband. I am your master. I own you. I bought you with my blood. Give me the, the most private, intimate, sensitive, vulnerable part of yourself. Give it all to me. I own you. I bought it. It's mine. I have the right to it. Give it to me. And you will find that when you give it to me, I will treasure it. And I will love you. And I will keep you. And I will never betray you. For I am the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love me and keep my commandments to a thousand generations. That's what God wants. That's what Deuteronomy 24, 1 and 2 is all about. And that's what Matthew chapter 19, verse 8 is all about. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain. They're not two anymore. They are one. One flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Man does not have the authority to put asunder what God hath joined together. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? They walked right into his clever trap. Hallelujah. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. Right there, Jesus testified to the people of Israel the reason that they were not going to enter into the kingdom of God. 
They asked him about this, and he led them to ask him about this. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, as we know it. I don't know if it had numbers back then, but we know it as Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. He led them right into this clever trap, if I may give him the credit for doing that, and if I may ascribe that to him. And, and they asked him this so that he could give them not only the answer to their question, but the solution to their perdition, because they were lost. They were lost. They were not going to enter into the kingdom of God in the condition that they were in when they spoke these words to Jesus. And Jesus gave them the answer. He gave them the answer outwardly to their outward question, and he gave them the answer inwardly to their inward problem, which is the fact that they were of their father, the devil. And if they didn't turn from the darkness unto the light, they would perish in their sins. Just like Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall perish in your sins. You shall die in your sins. So he gave them a key. He took it from his heart and he gave it to them. And they didn't even know what it was. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. That's not what marriage is. Marriage is the union of a man and a woman where they become one flesh. And because God found it necessary to add into his law the betrothal period when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, it was made manifest right in, in broad daylight before the people of Israel that if they continued to serve other gods while professing to know and serve the true God, that they were going to stand before him and he was going to give them a writing of divorcement and send them out of his house. And guess what? If God sends you out of his house, there isn't another good house to go to. Okay, You can't go to the house of Dagon and find refuge and salvation there. You can't go to the house of Bel and find refuge and salvation there. You can't go to the house of Diana of the Ephesians and find refuge and salvation there. Today the Catholics call her Mary. In those days the Ephesians called her Diana. She's also been called Asherah and Ishtar and Going all the way back to the origin, she was called Semiramis. You see? Today she's called God the Holy Spirit in the Protestant churches. The mother figure, the feminine aspect of God, as they say. Of course, there is no feminine aspect of God, but that's what the pagans say. They're worshiping other gods. Just like the Jews were worshiping other gods. You can go to the 8th chapter of Ezekiel and you can see how that God brought Ezekiel into the secret places inside the house that was called by the name of the Lord. And he saw secret chambers inside the house that was called by God's name, where there was painted on the wall creeping things and, and, and wicked, ungodly things that the, that, the, that the elders of the people of Israel were burning incense to. They were burning incense to paintings on the wall, just like the people in the Eastern Orthodox churches still do today. And the Catholics do it too. It's abomination. It's the religion of Babylon and Egypt. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 and 2 is about. It was never about a man and his wife. It was always about God and his people. And so as Jesus said to the Pharisees, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. As Jesus said to the people of Israel right here in Matthew chapter 19, when it was still the time of the Old Testament, so the entire word of the scripture testifies to you and me in this time of the New Testament, that if our hearts are hardened against God, whether we profess to be Christians or not, baptized in Jesus' name or not, speaking in tongues or not, if our hearts are hardened against God, and we are not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, if our hearts are not circumcised unto him, if he doesn't have full, unlimited, 100% access to the most sensitive and vulnerable places of our being, then we are not going to enter into his kingdom. We're only going to get to that point of the wedding. And then he's going to say, 
Uh, no, I never knew you. You can't enter into my kingdom because you're not holy. You would defile it. That's why I put this provision in my law for a man to put away his betrothed wife if she was found guilty of fornication. It wasn't about a man and his wife. It was about me and you. That's what he's going to say. And he's going to give you a writing of divorcement and send you out of his house into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's what Matthew 19.8 is about. Blessed be the name of the Lord and the reading of his holy word. Amen.